week. Um, this is uh, petition day. I am Mark Witherspoon. I am a lecturer in the Greenlee School and uh, advisor to the Iowa State Daily and Ethos Magazine and Uhuru Magazine. Uh, and I get the uh, privilege of honoring my heroes up here. Uh, not honoring them, but just uh, introducing them. Um, Petition is the, uh, what we call, I thought was going to be the uh, forgotten um, freedom in the First Amendment. Uh, according to uh, surveys uh, going back to 1997, annual surveys by the First Amendment Center on the state of the First Amendment, only one <coughs> in 100 Americans can name petition as a freedom uh, in the First Amendment. Uh, so we, as the, as the First Amendment Committee, uh, started looking for how were we going to have a whole day devoted to petition, we thought, hmm, we might have some problem finding some speakers. Uh, fortunately, that wasn't the case. Uh, we have petition going every which way in Iowa. Um, and the beautiful part of, of um, Petition is, is there's so many ways to go about it. Uh, as you as you know, petition and assembly are kind of related. Uh, assembly, we can all get together and uh, talk about what we don't like, what we do like, what whatever. Petition is similar but opposite in the fact that it, you can have a minimum of one person who doesn't like what the government is doing, and that one person can go and do what he or she wants to do to tell the government, hey, I don't like what you're doing. Uh, it can be a, a petition uh, with signatures. It can be a lawsuit. It can be a, 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 a petition to, to remove people from office. And, and there's other ways to go about this, to uh, tell what you think. I want to uh, quickly uh, introduce um, uh, the panelists up here, and then I'm going to let them have it. Uh, but before I introduce them, I want to introduce one other person uh, who I think uh, is very integral here. Uh, actually, I've introduced two, but the other one is not here at the moment. Um, the Clark Kaufman, a reporter at the, uh, not just a reporter, the, uh, one of the best reporters in Iowa, uh, who works for the Des Moines Register, uh, did a series of stories, ah, the other one just walked in, um, did a series of stories in the Register earlier uh, last year, uh, last year, um, about uh, Cass County and its auditor and sheriff doing some uh, uh, things, things people thought might not be exactly honest. Um, uh, and uh, Clark, would you stand up? And for this series, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, which is the, uh, as, in, as far as journalism is concerned, that's the Oscars. Um, so uh, Clark, I, I think we need a round of applause for Clark. Clark. He epitomizes what we at the Greenlee School consider great journalism, which is informing the public and educating the public about information, uh, uh, about uh, issues that they need to know so they can make better decisions about how to um, uh, improve their community. And in this case, it worked to perfection, and I'm going to let uh, uh, Mr. Fellmeyer, uh, uh talk about that. Uh, we have three cases tonight that we're going to be talking about. Um, we have Arlen Nichols and Mark Gannon, who uh, successfully sued the Iowa State Foundation uh, for, uh, uh, to open their records. Uh, we have uh, Ronald Fellmeyer uh, representing the, it's the Cass County Seven, who I think we need to stand up and uh, uh, give them a round of applause too for for their. Um, they're here. I think six of them. Yeah. And I will. Uh, I'm sure uh, Mr. Fellmeyer will will uh, talk about them, but I will also uh, introduce them a little bit later. 
And then we have Henry Alliger and Ryan Dahl, who uh, successfully petitioned to get a, an issue important to Iowa State students on a special election ballot. Uh, that is the uh, city council uh, term uh, of two years instead of the four years that they have right now. Um, now, I'm getting off, and I'm gonna let you come listen to their stories about how these First Amendment, I was gonna say advocates, but I think heroes partake of their First Amendment rights to rectify what they considered injustice. Uh, and we're gonna let uh, Ryan and Henry start. Ryan's gotta to run to class, so I guess we'll tell our story pretty quickly. Um, one thing I think that Mark kind of alluded to in his opening, but is, uh, was probably a little understated, is just how little people know about the right to petition. Um, I think everybody on the panel, as we were talking just beforehand, uh, during at least some point, uh, didn't know that, that petitioning was included in the First Amendment. I know that Ryan and I were a little bit confused when we were asked to talk uh, during First Amendment week as, as to what it was until uh, we talked to Mark a little bit more and found out that it was the right to petition that he was interested in. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> uh, we, were, we were doing some background research on First Amendment and thought the, the right to petition was kind of an interesting uh, evolution of rights. Uh, it was derived from the Magna Carta, um, but it really came to fruition in the United States uh, during the 1830s. Um, the, uh, the citizens of the District of Columbia were sending letters and uh, uh, repeatedly um, approaching the House of Representatives to uh, make slavery, slavery illegal in Washington, D.C. And it was bogging down business of the House, so they adopted a standing order uh, that said that uh, that was an issue that was um, out of bounds and that they wouldn't accept any petitions on it, uh, which was subsequently repealed. Um, but is one of the only um, case laws in the United States where the right to petition has been denied uh, at the federal level, which we found a little bit interesting. But as far as our story, um, we petitioned uh, on behalf of 731 uh, residents of Ames for the right to have a special election uh, on the city council term links uh, reducing them from four to two years, which is the default term length in Iowa. Uh, and that election was held on the 5th of April, and uh, even though voter turnout was rather low and uh, our issue did fail, we think that it was a very vital part uh, in the progress of Ames striving towards the stated uh, one community objective. Um, some of the things that we did <clears throat> in our process were uh, during a joint meeting between the City Council and the Government of the Student Body Senate, uh, we had legislation up to support this special election, which uh, passed unanimously. Uh, and then after that time, we collected the signatures uh, and submitted those through the, the appropriate channels, through the county auditor, or the county, uh, and then back to the city and addressed the city at one of their meetings to set the date, which uh, was the 5th of April, like I said, which was held jointly with the hotel-motel tax question. Uh, and then we held a education and um, voter registration campaign, uh, which included uh, a number of letters to the editor of both the Daily and the Tribune, as well as uh, an editorial in the Daily, uh, and a number of stories in both those papers, as well as an extensive amount of canvassing in the community, as well as on campus. Uh, and I think that um, if there's one thing that can be taken from our campaign, uh, even in defeat, it was the impact that just a few individuals can have. Uh, we concentrated most of our canvassing efforts door-to-door uh, -door campaigning uh, in Ward 2-4 in, in that precinct, uh, which was the highest voter turnout in Ames or in, the, in this election with uh, 490 individuals, even though only 135 of them voted on our side. Uh, <laughs> as opposed to 4-5, uh, which had 56 individuals vote, and 50 of them voted on our side. So our signs must have worked as well. Uh, um, if there was, I think there was just a few problems um, in, our, in our campaign, one of which was uh, an assumption was made 
that due to the extensive voter registration efforts by New Voters Project and both parties for the presidential election in November, we felt that uh, most community members in Ames would have already been registered at their current address, and that was somewhat of an oversight. We probably had um, four or 500 students uh, that we talked to that had either changed address um, or had registered for the uh, general election at their, their parents' address, so they weren't able to vote in this election and didn't know that the registration deadline uh, was a week and a half before the election. Uh, so that hurt our efforts a little bit. And then um, some people view the, uh, the defeat as a problem, but uh, one of our main goals was to bring the discussion to the table of uh, students or uh, the concern of part of the community that they were not being represented by the city council and uh, this part of the community is commonly referred to as students but we refer to them as uh, community members who attend Iowa State um, and uh, I think that um, a moment in the campaign that kind of uh, illustrated our point was the front page of the daily a few days before the election uh, had the headline of not just passing through. And I think that that was exactly what we were trying to get across is that um, students uh, and in other individuals who are only in Ames for a limited period of time are still have a very important interest and are very interested uh, in the government of Ames. Uh, one statistic that we came across uh, during our campaign was that uh, Forty-seven percent of Americans change residence at least once every five years, and I think that that's something that's often overlooked in this debate about uh, students just coming into a town uh, and trying to make radical changes and then being go uh, gone in uh, four or five years. So, um, I think that we were successful even in defeat. So. Um, Henry pretty much went over the election and if you guys can't hear me I apologize I did lose my voice during this campaign and I am still um, trying to work on getting it back so if you can't hear me just let me know uh, the biggest thing that I found interesting when we were looking up information on the right to petition was um, the right to assemble and how that was pretty much considered a subsidiary point to the right to petition that the right to petition was the bigger issue when they first when this was first set up um, and a lot of that goes back to turn of the century labor unions when they were trying to set up They were trying to get together to get petitions to change change things and That's where you see a lot of the case law and a lot of the um, court cases that came out of this They went more with the freedom to assemble and not so much with the right to petition um, the, yeah, the other thing that we found that was really exciting or that was really interesting with this was the ease of um, the ease of getting a petition together. When we first presented this to the city council and talked to uh, Mayor Tedesco and the city attorney, they said that we could go about doing this, but we would have to get 10% of the people that voted in the last general election. And at first, that had us kind of scared until we realized that only 4,625 people voted in the last um, general election. And so it only took us 420 or 463 signatures. So for as much as people don't know about the right to petition, it is extremely simple to use and I think can make a very lasting and important change. So I guess we will pass this on. You go next. Yeah, go. <clears throat> I'm sure that when our founding fathers put uh, the right to petition in the Constitution, they were not thinking about creating a right. To, they were not thinking about a right to petition a court for the removal of the county sheriff or the county attorney, as my clients did last year in Cass County. Uh, I want to first uh, say that I appreciate the uh, School of Journalism sponsoring this sort of an event and it's fun to uh, tell about our success in Cass County and removing, removing the county attorney and sheriff. But before re reviewing how the legal mechanics got going in this case, we must point out that nothing would have ever happened if it was not for the exercise of the freedom of press 
and the work of Kaufman and the Des Moines Register. Um, his, his efforts uh, in that regard were somewhat overwhelming. He did day after day of study of the records of the Cass County Courthouse. Uh, he interviewed witnesses. Uh, his his uh, report was a very first class job of reporting on what happened. And I uh, can't thank him enough for what it did for the petitioners because uh, without his work it would have been a very difficult task. My involvement uh, got started because uh, I'm the chairman of the Cass County Democratic Party in Cass County <coughs> and our central committee uh, met in, in, uh, in July and this report of, of uh, Mr. Kaufman was done was published in the Des Moines Register on February 15th of last year, and and about and shortly after that there was a a uh, investigation ordered by the uh, uh, the state auditor's office and and there was not an order ordered about that time, and. Uh, and a couple of events happened on that occasion uh, as soon as this news story came out. One was uh, the auditor's uh, thing and the other was the day after that happened there was a bunch of firearms moved from uh, the county attorney's uh, possession to the sh sheriff's possession. These firearms belonged to the county. At any rate, uh, um, I was meeting with my central committee meeting in, in I believe early July of 2004 and, and there had just been a report uh, filed. This was about, took about four and a half months for the state auditor to make their report and had, had a lot of uh, my fellow members that were disturbed by the fact that uh, these individuals we're still in office. Uh, the state auditor's report was there, and uh, it was very damning in our judgment. And we passed a resolution calling for their uh, resignation, which uh, made the press. Um, as a result of that July meeting, the uh, and the adoption of the resolution uh, it prompted Mr. Tyler of Atlantic, a uh, prominent Republican in the community, to write a letter. And as I recall, he indicated that is one time he agreed with the Democrats, <laughs> which made me feel good. Uh, and later on, Mr. Tyler uh, contacted me and discussed uh, what was possibility, and he asked me about uh, a recall petition. Well, those of you who are not familiar with it, the state of Iowa, to my knowledge, has no provision for recall and related to any political office uh, and, and we live out in close to Nebraska and besides uh, Nebraska football uh, we hear about Nebraska recall and Nebraska all kinds of things they, they legislate all their government by petition which is off the subject but I think it's a lousy way to do to, to uh, do uh, your legislating but anyway uh, when Mr. Tyler was into my office, I told him about Chapter 66 of the Code of Iowa, and, and that pro provisions of that chapter are not very much used. Uh, it is, uh, uh, in, in fact, when we got involved in this and started to do research, it had been approximately uh, 20 or 30 years since there had been a case that we could find that dealt with the right of petition for removal. Uh, he discussed with me the possibility of going forward with that. I told him that under those provisions there was a requirement that one post uh, bond and that would have to be set by a judge and I had no idea what uh, that would be. Um, and he said, well, let's, let's move on. And I said, well, I wasn't sure our firm would want to get involved in that. I would have to check with my partners. and. Uh, and we, we had reviewed the state auditor's report and frankly I felt that anybody that read that report should be very disturbed. And I thought there was enough in the state auditor's report which was available on the internet to uh, uh, 
make anybody believe that uh, there was no reason that these individuals should continue in office, at least continue in the office without uh, doing something that uh, would rectify the sort of things that were complained about. And I'll discuss those a little further later. Um, I told Mr. Tyler that it took five, at least five plaintiffs to bring this lawsuit or petitioners. Uh, and uh, he said that he knew that he could come up with those individuals. And, and a few days later, he did come up with those. Uh, while my firm had real concerns about this, we felt that it was something that somebody had to undertake. And it really, even though we were well acquainted and had to deal with both the county attorney and sheriff for many years, it was something that just had to be done, and, and we undertook it. Um, and that uh, all occurred in, in late July, and on July 30th of last year, the petition was filed in district court. Uh, and uh, that was almost uh, five and a half months after the Des Moines Register's uh, story on the thing. Uh, in order to uh, conduct these proceedings, uh, somebody had to be a, appointed as a uh, prosecutor. The state law, Chapter 66, which provides for these kinds of things, um, has the county attorney conducting those proceedings, except, of course, when the county attorney is the defendant. He couldn't hardly do that. So uh, the district court has the authority to appoint uh, a prosecutor. And the, you know, since the county attorney and the county sheriff were alleged to be acting in concert in the things they were doing, it, the, you know, the county attorney, of course, had a conflict in that regard. So we had to have the district court um, appoint a special uh, appoint a prosecutor. They appointed me. Of course, by this time, I'm the only one around that has enough knowledge, really, to do it anyhow. But uh, I was appointed as a special prosecutor for the county attorney and, and temporarily as the prosecutor for the county sheriff. Uh, and uh, that had to be approved by the Board of Supervisors, which eventually was done. Uh, th this chapter of the code uh, provided that uh, uh, the proceedings had to commence within 20 days. One of the things, though, that we could do was ask for an outside judge, somebody from outside the judicial district. And because of the close relationship between a county prosecutor and the local judge, we felt that was a necessity. And so we asked for an outside judge. And uh, uh, that the suit was started on the 30th of, uh, of uh, Ju July. And it was the 17th of August before the special judge was appointed. That was. Uh, Robert Hutchinson of Des Moines, and, and a very fine judge indeed. One of the other things that had to happen was a bond had to be posted, and I had to go before the district court of, out there. Uh, the chief judge of the district was the only one that would take it on, and he uh, set a $25,000 bond in each case. Um, and uh, this bond is for the purpose of if, if the petitioners lose, uh, then this bond was to pay the defendant's uh, attorney's fees for defending the case. So these petitioners not only signed the petition, actually they didn't sign it, I signed it for them, but uh, they signed it, but they also put their money on the line as far as this prosecution of this case. Uh, the statute provided that the cases had to be started within 20 days, um, and the Supreme Court was 17 or uh, 20 days appointing the judge, so we couldn't serve notice on the defendants until the 20 days was up. That gave us time to get the bond in place, and, and we were ready to go, and the judge set a hearing, I think, within two or three days of when the petition was filed. <clears throat> and. I mean, from when he became the appointed judge. 
and uh, and he immediately set the trials and we had asked that the trials be combined because of the, the conduct which I'll discuss a little further uh, was so much they did so many things in common but he s separated the two and one was scheduled to start uh, August 30th 13 days after he was appointed and um, the second one was uh, to start September 7th, which was all within 20 days. Now, um, this is very short time in lawyers' time. I, I don't know how it is with anybody else. If you dealt with lawyers, they don't always get things done in, in that short of period of time. Needless to say, very few of the lawyers got much sleep for that uh, period of uh, about 20, 25, 26 days. Um, I later talked to Judge Hutchinson about it and he said it was uh, the most stressful period that he had ever gone through during the same uh, time. So I guess it wasn't only us lawyers that were at risk at that time. Well, I've taken a long time to uh, get to the allegations in the petition that we filed and what Clark Kaufman had brought to the public's attention more than anything else was the fact that the county attorney was making plea bargains which were saving people from losing their driver's license. At the trial it was shown that Mr. Berry made hundreds of plea arrangements where people could change speeding and other moving violations into non-moving violations. And the hot case in that, the one that really blew me away was one that uh, a young lady was driving a 2003 BMW, and it was a, and it was in the year 2003, so it couldn't have been a very old car. She was clocked at doing 93 miles an hour. The individual was able to trade that one ticket for six defective violations on a quote 2003 BMW and uh, to pay a fine which was $155 for each five miles an hour over the speed limit. This was a policy that Mr. Berry had established. Uh, his, that fine was $930. The fine was not authorized by Iowa law. <coughs> uh, so uh, this individual had converted out of uh, moving violation into non-moving violations. One of the things that came out in this procedure was that the uh, county attorney was asking everybody to sign an affidavit that said, uh, I was driving that car on that day and I was guilty of all these crimes and then they would list the, the six defective things that they had in their car. Uh, these were usually rear view mirror and mud flap or whatever. It didn't, they all were phony as could be. On cross-examination of the county attorney, I pestered him pretty good about that, and I asked him repeatedly if he believed those affidavits, and for a long, long time his answer was I had no reason to disbelieve them. And finally, after he had said that for about a uh, couple hours, and all these individuals here can testify that in fact I did make him testify to that. Uh, he finally admitted that, uh, yes, he did believe all those people. Um, the interesting uh, thing about all that was that he had been publicly reprimanded by the Iowa Bar Ethics Commission uh, for his conduct with respect to those, and uh, he had uh, and this had gone to the commission and the way that works is if you disagree with that you have a right to appeal it to the Supreme Court. He did not do that and in fact put out a, a news release that he was accepting that. Uh, this did not set well with the trial judge in the case because there's a little one thing to say you're not uh, challenging the action of the uh, commission, uh, of the ethics commission and then to go into court and try and uh, dispute and and take the position that you really you didn't do anything wrong was just a little hard, little hard for the judge to swallow. In his news story and his work for the news story I should say 
Uh, Clark Kaufman also discovered the sheriff had a fund that was referred to as a drug fund. Uh, the state auditor also investigated this and, and learned that the sheriff, with the knowledge and assistance of the county attorney, was feeding this fund. This was by in, improper methods, including um, the handling of drug forfeitures and, and automobile forfeiture, forfeitures. These monies were going into this account in the sheriff's office. <clears throat> uh, the sheriff was not only using these funds uh, for drug investigations, we'll give him credit, he was using it for that. He also did, did things like sponsor fees for golf tournaments, uh, purchase cell phones uh, for the county attorney and others. And uh, there were quite a number of items, a page of items that we cross-examined them about at the time of trial. Uh, while both of the defendants denied that there was any impropriety in how they were handled.